Uh, my name is Josh Williams, Head of Partnerships for CD Valet. Um, CD Valet is a digital marketplace that allows consumers to go shop for and open CDs with regional and community FIs, including banks and credit unions. Um, I head of partnerships, and so uh, I do all, I lead our team and all of our outreach to banks and credit unions that are trying to get up and running on CD Valet as one of their deposit strategies to um, go acquire new retail deposits and customers. Um, I, prior to this, uh, I was a chief banking officer for, um, uh, for Seattle Bank, a community bank, and prior to that, had over 15 years with Wells Fargo, so a long time in banking. Um, and, uh, and excited to be with you guys here today and, and really appreciate Financial Brand making um, uh, some time available to talk about deposits in general. A lot of fintech conferences that we go to, I think, miss what's a really important topic in the industry. And I think we're excited about this format to be able to dig in a little bit. We're gonna, of course, talk about CD Valet, but really just talk more broadly about strategies uh, for thinking about CDs in general and, and going to market. And I'm happy to be joined here by Howie Wu, our head of product, and I'll let him introduce himself as well before we jump in. Yeah, afternoon, everyone. Uh, very nice to meet everybody. Appreciate you guys attending. Um, yeah, been been a good ride with CD Valet. Uh, joined uh, with the product team uh, pretty much at the beginning of the product. We've been live now a little over a year as far as the product goes. Um, and prior to that, I was the uh, uh, the head of digital for consumer and private wealth for a institution called First Republic Bank, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Uh, that obviously no longer is uh, in existence, unfortunately. Um, I was with them for five years. I led most of their digital on the consumer side. Uh, great organization, great entity, obviously focused very much on deposit gathering and I'll certainly share more details and specifics around that and some strategies that, that you know, sort of we employed there. Uh, and then prior to that, I was the head of digital for Boeing Employees Credit Union for 15 years prior to that. Um, so BECU, which you're probably familiar with, fourth largest credit union in the country. Uh, and pretty much led their digital strategy from the onset of that organization um, being very much a brick and mortar to begin with. Um, and then I was brought on to basically develop and, and really drive their entire digital strategy to what it is today. So uh, we'll certainly share more on that as well. Great. Okay, well, we've got a couple opportunities for some crowd uh, interaction. So uh, first, you can scan this QR code and you can take, you can do some voting and there'll be a couple other opportunities for that. And then later, there'll be a chance to scan a QR code at the very end where you can get a trial to one of our market intelligence tools, um, which we'll talk a little bit more about. But essentially, it takes all of the data that we're tracking, which today is uh, over 3,000 FIs, over 20,000 rates every single day. And that data is being made available to consumers when they come to our site, which Howie will walk through. But then we've also basically taken that unique insight and made a tool that FIs can use to basically see the market to help them uh, structure and price their deposit offerings. So there'll be an offering for that. Um, so we can, we'll see, we'll see how this uh, comes up here uh, in a minute, but I'll talk over it and I'll just jump ahead by telling you, um, uh, that, you know, really what we're here to do at CD Valley is solve the biggest problem in community banking. And arguably it's the biggest problem in banking overall, uh, but I think it's really important to think about this as community banking, not, and community banking in my mind doesn't matter if you're a bank or a credit union or how many branches or, you know, employees you have, it's really what are the business lines that you're in. And we know that community banks, again, broadly defined, uh, drive most of the uh, small business lending, most of the commercial real estate lending, ag lending, uh, certainly infill home construction, remodeling, smaller projects, all the things that are really important to our communities uh, that gets handled by community banks, they're not solved by the Wall Street banks. But to do that like vital activity that our communities need, the economies need, our customers need, uh, you have to have community banks and community banks have to have deposits. Uh, no surprise, um, uh, we see a lot of, uh, a lot of interest in, in building these deposits. So what's gone on here, uh, and of course I'm preaching to the choir, um, but if we go to the next slide, I think we'll get to this. Um, you know, essentially what's happened is as the, uh, as the rates have risen, there's a Warren Buffett quote, right, where he says, when the tide goes out, you find out who's swimming without any bathing suit. And that's kind of what's happened, right? Like, Rates went up, the tide's gone out, and now we realize, hey, a lot of us in the industry built entire asset generation models that were assumed that the cost of capital would always be essentially zero. Really made the bet uh, that customers would never wanna get paid for their deposits. 
And that would be difficult to go to your shareholder meeting and say that was your strategy or the assumption underlying your business. But we know that that was the case and not to pick on Howie, but we have some pretty big examples in the industry where that's the bet they took, right? So those players are out of the market because of just really aggressive interest rate risk. But even now, we still know many of us are still constrained by the same challenge, right? The reality is we have loans on the books that are now underwater economically. Even if the credit risk is fine, um, you know, even if other elements of those work out, uh, you're just not making enough on those loans relative to today's deposit costs. So that's uh, the huge problem when the tide goes out. But interestingly, when that happens, if you sort of look around a little bit, there's some interesting things like on the one hand, um, and again, no surprise for the most part, the four biggest banks, right? Wells, B of A, Chase, and Citi, they're growing in deposits at a time when uh, they're also the lowest payers on deposits. So they're basically out earning deposits, earning community banks deposits and funding source because they have massive scale in terms of business lines, investments in technology, investments in marketing. And of course they get the sort of not talked about, but we all know it's the case, like too big to fail sort of implied support that people feel like, hey, and, and a perp, you know, if there's a problem, we know we'll be okay because we get bailed out. So they're benefiting from all of those factors. So on the one hand, if we're now figuring out how to go out and compete in the market, you have those four banks on one end of the barbell that they don't have to compete on price because they can compete on all these other things. And by the way, they can amortize it over 30 million customers, 50 million customers. It's pretty easy to spend a lot on any problem when you can spread it out over that many customers, right? But on the other side of that barbell, you have four other banks, right? And uh, they're Goldman, Capital One, Ally, and Discover. And who knows, maybe Discover will, maybe that will become three banks, right? But what do those banks all have in common? Well, those are banks, uh, and Goldman's a little bit of an outlier, right? But the first three, they're all auto, or they're all credit card, auto, or personal loans, uh, and, so, and or subprime. They have very high yielding assets. So they built a business knowing they were gonna have to pay a, a competitive cost of capital. And so they've always been those consistent high rate payers, which is why they're always showing up uh, when you Google. Goldman's a little bit of an outlier, right? Because they're an investment bank. But the point is, if you give Goldman money, they'll make money. So they just figured out if they were a commercial bank that they'd make money. So in that sense, they look like those other players in terms of how they operate in the market. And the reason this is important is because all the rest of us, right? Uh, those banks, by the way, combined have 40% of the CDs. I don't have the number right now for this quarter of, of deposits, but it correlates 40% of the CDs to, four, to eight banks. The other 60% is spread out over 9,500 banks. And those banks have to figure out, well, do I try to go compete on rate and technology with Capital One, or do I try to compete without any rate with uh, you know, Chase? It's an awkward situation, right? And on top of that, right, if, if matters weren't were already bad enough, right, when we look around, it's the reality is uh, basically Banking has started to come into digital conversion, places like Financial Brand, and a lot of people here have been doing a lot to drive that forward for many years. But of course, it really took off in COVID, right? Some of that is just consumer adoption. Some of it was just force. We hit some matter of tipping points and people that five years ago would not open an account online will open an account online now. So uh, this digital conversion has changed. And yet at the same time, most banks still don't have the ability to easily go out and go get customers digitally. And if what other industry right now would say that that's the case, right? None. And it's not because we're not hardworking. It's not because we're, you know, uh, not smart. The reality is for the last 10, 15 years, deposits just came in. You could take them for granted. We all spend our time, money, and energy getting loan acquisition, right? Advertising, technology, business models, partnerships. So this whole part of the business just wasn't invested in. And so what's happened is now if somebody goes and says, I'm gonna Google best CD rates, they're gonna find bank rate. When they go to bank rate, they're gonna find those four banks that I mentioned, uh, the, the high payers and a handful of other high payers. And anyone that looks at that would think, well, this must be the digital de deposit marketplace in the US. But it's just not, right? That's a totally distorted reflection of what's going on because we all know there are community and regional FIs that are paying equal or higher rates at any given time that are not showing up on bank rate. Uh, we know that because we track uh, 33,000 rates and we know that most of them are not on bank rate. And not only that, we go and say, hey, how many rates do we have over 6%? And we compare that all the time like this. And if you get our MIT, you'll be able to see some of that. Uh, 
so the problem is, is that, it, that this marketplace has been basically created around those four big players. And again, there's nothing, there's nothing, not, it's not a criticism, right? But those four big players had just a very different business. Because yeah, the other important part of it is, as I mentioned, they're mostly credit card issuers. And what do credit card issuers also do? A lot of advertising, a lot of digital, a lot of lead gen, a lot of using platforms like Bankrate and other paid um, sites. So this is what's happened, right? This is the space that we now find ourselves in in community banking that we need to that basically go and compete in. And uh, while this is a big problem, the reality is most problems are, you know, it's like Bill Gates says like, don't overestimate what you can do in the short term, but don't underestimate what you can do in the long term, right? The reality is there are still huge opportunities. There have been some cataclysmic failures, but for the most part, the industry is still very, very strong. And we're not seeing a lot of fallout. Will there be consolidation? Yes. Are there challenges for all community FIs to figure out how to sort of get themselves back into this new rate environment? Absolutely. That's why everybody, that's why that was the number one vote on the screen. But there are opportunities. So the first is rates have gone up, consumers have woken up, and they're willing to go shop. Because before it didn't matter if you had rates sitting at 30 basis points at Wells or B of A of Chase. Uh, it just didn't matter because the, the additional interest you could earn somewhere else wasn't worth your time. Well, now it's worth your time. Two, uh, the technology is getting better. It's still lagging. We still have a major technical debt to build on the bank, on the deposit side, and how he's going to talk about that. But it's getting better all the time, and there are plenty of players, even at this, um, at this conference, who are, who are bringing great solutions for that. And then lastly, hey, there's some new scrutiny coming out from the CFPB on these uh, pay to play rate sites. And so that's really going to change the models that those big four have been able to rely on for how they get leads of people thinking, oh, I just got, I found the best rates. And that's going to dramatically change. We're already seeing changes in how that advertising has happened by those FIs and on those sites. And that's opening up a new opportunity for transparency and better information for customers. So. We're, we're here to talk about, so like, what are some of the ways we can go about this? Um, we absolutely think it's like uh, anybody who's not taking this seriously is not paying attention uh, to banking. And the good news is there's, there's, um, there's real opportunity to, to solve it. And how he's going to talk a little bit about on the tech side um, uh, of what this looks like. Yeah, thanks, Josh. Um, so yeah, on the on the technology side, it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting landscape, right? Because obviously, as Josh alluded to, you know, the industry has obviously been building a lot on the on the asset generation side, right? The loan, you know, concentrating on the other side of the balance sheet loans. It's been a it's been a loan game for, you know, arguably, I'll call it pre iPhone all the way up to pre iPhone days. Right. And so um, so lots of institutions are obviously, you know, very, very familiar with that landscape, very familiar with that with that ball game, And it's kind of this whole concept now where the industry is saying, hey, well, we need to obviously focus on building the tech, building the, the capabilities to do so. And there is a bit of a sort of a thought process of, 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 you know, if you build it, they will come. Well, we all know, I think we're all in this room, we're all bankers and, you know, credit union folks, and we all understand that that's just not the reality of things, right? I mean, you, you have to obviously go after your consumers. Consumers are smart people and and generally now they're even smarter because they're very digitally savvy there's lots of technology you know you could argue you know with artificial intelligence coming down the path they're gonna supposedly get even smarter right and so to be competitive you have to be able to you know market you have to be able to play smart you have to actually get after uh, you know the, the the actual customer and so when you look at the, uh, the data today, right, and you look at institutions, as I, as I mentioned, you know, focused on the, on the lending side, you know, over 50% of institutions today don't have a digital, you know, deposit origination solution, right? Some have a mix of both. Some have some that, you know, isn't fully baked. Some have invested, you know, early back in the days, but then, you know, sort of left it to be and, you know, sort of that whole concept of if you build it, they will come and kind of let that strategy continue to carry forward. Um, and it's put, you know, lots of institutions in an awkward position now, right? Because with the raise, rising rate environment and competition being extra stiff, now it's like, okay, now we got to get after it. On top of that, you know, branches was, you know, obviously a strategy, right? Like branch, the branch model was always sort of seen as like, you know, hey, they're, they're the, they're, they're just, you know, if you build it, same thing, right? Like the, the deposits will just come. You know, they're big money centers. 
Um, and this was kind of the philosophy even, you know, when I was at First Republic, if you look at the First Republic concept, it was very focused obviously on high net worth, but it generally was very focused on, let's just build more branches, right? Every branch that you build will bring X dollars in deposits. Could potentially work that way. Obviously the First Republic model is very unique as well because it was, you know, very, very much relationship based, which is key, right? So to my point, it's not just about building it and people will come. You have to establish that relationship. You have to be able to market to them. You have to, you know, drive value, deliver value. And so even on the branch model, I mean, every time we opened up a branch, even in the First Republic footprint, it was negative, you know, it was in the, in the red, cons you know, considerably for a relatively long time, right? So the investment is huge in that branch model. And so when I joined First Republic, the whole, path down it was like okay we have to build digital we have to get savvy obviously you also have to accommodate to the younger demographics who are used to technology right we all know that in this room in order to to compete especially with the bigger players you got to have the technology to be able to, to 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 support that 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 growing consumer base and so today when you look at you look at institutions trying to do it we all know we all have a mix mosh of different technologies Core systems are always a challenge. Everybody's on a different core. And even if you are on a similar core, right, everybody has unique customizations related to those cores. And so integration into a core and actually building that out is, is a, ton, a tremendous amount of tech debt. And for most institutions, you know, having that capital spend and having the resources to, to put that effort forth is, is super, super challenging. And so being, you know, so being, um, able to leverage technologies like ours and solutions and marketplaces like ours, right, gives you a, a, an alternative path in, in from an investment standpoint so that you don't necessarily have to do uh, that, that heavily, heavy lift. Um, and then, you know, like, like the, the way that you really think that we thought of, you know, from a technology standpoint, as I mentioned earlier, consumers are shopping, right? Ultimately, they're always shopping. I mean, I, I, it's, it's interesting. I talked to a CMO the other day and one of the things that he mentioned was like, hey, I don't wanna, you know, I don't want, I want the lowest cost of funds. Well, we all, we all as bankers want lowest cost of funds, but ultimately consumers are smart people. And I asked him the question, I said, well, you're, you know, put your CMO hat to a side for a minute, right? And if you were shopping for a CD, right, would you go and get a lower rate than what's available out in the marketplace? You wouldn't do that, right? Like you're, you're a smart person, right? So. So it's, it's awkward that in our industry, as people that work in the industry, we, we seem to think that we can like arguably trick consumers into buying, you know, lesser product at a lesser rate so that we can have cheaper cost of funds. That's just not the reality of things anymore, right? It made sense before when rates were pretty much zero, right? And it was an equal playing field. Now you totally have to be extremely competitive. And so I think that's where we have to really just start thinking about, okay, what are the alternative strategies and what are the things that we need to do to drive um, adoption, usage, volume, all through sort of digital means, right? And how do you build your digital strategies to actually accomplish that? So with that, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll pass it over to Josh for the next set of myths. And need, we'll, need your votes first. You should, you should have your mentee up and running um, and this should, I think, fire up for you. You shouldn't have to scan. So if you still have the previous one open, it should actually just auto load this, this particular question. I just want to say one thing. Yeah. It's interesting because, you know, we're here talking about like, you know, what differentiates different banks, different credit unions, like for the consumer. But the consumer right now literally just wants the rate. Like, they're almost willing to sacrifice customer service for the rate. So then how do you even compete with that? If they don't care about the customer service or the relationship or the learner, then how do you, if you cannot, if you as a bank cannot reduce your rate because of the cost of funds, then how do you even, where do you, where do you land in that game with the competing? That, that, that's the big yeah. issue I have right now. I think it, yeah, I think you're right on, right? And we hear this all the time and it makes sense. I think the, uh, maybe part of the view uh, that's evolved for us, uh, has been to be really thoughtful about like what part of the wallet are we competing for, right? And what's the consumer trying to solve with that one problem? 
And this is the reason we're, by the way, we're not, it's not all about CDs, right? But we're gonna talk about why we keep talking about it. CDs are interesting for this reason because the heavy CD users uh, on average have hundreds of thousands of dollars in CDs. They often have multiple of them. Oftentimes they're at multiple banks and they often, um, uh, and they often aggressively shop for rate, like almost for a sport or satisfaction, right? And so uh, to Howie's sort of analogy with the rate refi, you know, uh, if people will give up a little bit and we do see this on the site, you know, if you have comparable rates and one is local and they know the FI, they're not always gonna give up. They might give up an eighth or a quarter or something like that. Or if one can open right now, we definitely see those getting uh, action on those, even though there's a higher rate above where there's no way to do it. So I think there are some functionals, but in general, I think your recognition is correct. Like when the consumer is going to say, I have a couple hundred thousand dollars and I want to go save it. What should I do? Then that's the thing. And we should, yeah, move it somewhere else. Or we'll talk about some other ways to say, is there a way? So it's not all or nothing, right? For the FI. But so we totally agree with that tension. Uh, okay, so let's run through this. So just so we're clear, the survey says that survey or CD clients are just rate chasers. That's pretty high, too expensive, pretty high. CDs are hot money. Okay, I like this, this is okay. And then um, and then this is very good. All right, over on the right, good. We have an optimistic like crowd. So, all right, well, let's jump into these then. So the first one, uh, next slide. Um, uh, this is, sort of a myth as we were just saying right it's partially true right the reality is this is the primary motivator right and this is the whole point of like uh marketing and saying hey it's a commodity product it's all insured it's a set term hopefully you've narrowed it down to just a handful of key variables and at that point you should decide on rate that's the rational thing to do it's the right thing to do for you your family etc um so yes we we think this is generally true however back to there are those functional elements where people are still willing to work with somebody local and we'll talk some about some other ways that um, cd clients start to potentially engage differently and also might be ways to just get more of their business um, so we'll say this one is uh true the second one cds are too expensive a lot of people think this but this is really just back to the mindset of are they expensive relative to what first of all the opportunity cost of sort of not being able to grow or not being able to support the book uh, what the other funding sources are, and then really thinking through um, on a transactional basis, if you have to go get deposits, uh, the average CD at a bank is 100,000, the average CD, bank, uh, CD at a credit union is 46,000. If you have to go get deposits and you have to go like do all the effort and go through the process uh, and you're gonna get some, I'd rather get a 45,000 or $100,000 average account than a checking account that might not have ever be funded uh, I have more unit costs because I probably have online banking statements, a whole bunch of other things. Plus I had to set up bill pay, debit card, all these things. So CDs, yes, they're a higher cost generally because as we just said, people are shopping on rate relative to all those other functional things. But if the point is how do we quickly move the needle to get deposits on balance sheet, uh, CDs are often, uh, not only are they not expensive, they're honestly a really good value. I'll also say that fraudsters won't open a CD. <laughs> yeah. So not never, but yes, yeah, same thing. We see extremely why would, low. Why would they put their money in a CD where it's going to sit for seven or 13 months? And yeah. Be able to it? So what we as a bank are trying to do is figure out, like, should we start making our products that are offered online more tailored to people who are not going to be fraudsters? Whereas like a little, literally a fraudster will open a checking account because they can move those funds yep. to a credit card, a debit card, or yeah. CDs, offer them a higher rate, let them, let them come in and, and get those deposits in. Yeah. Typically they're not That's what we're so, yeah, great point. I'm adding that to my talking points. Thank you. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, myth three, hot money. Okay. I, th I actually glad to see that this crowd thinks that's a, rel a relatively uncommon conception. So again, if, if what we're saying about hot money is they're rate sensitive, then yes, we've already talked about that. But in general, uh, one, we see that um, FIs that maintain competitive rates tend to have at least 70% retention a year, and that can run out several years. So again, back to that cost of acquisition, if you think about the lifetime value and the average balances of it, more like a three-year duration, then the number starts to look really good. Almost no one pulls their money out of a CD uh, and breaks it. Even when you go to them and say, you could break this, pay the fee and make more on this, almost no one will do it. 
uh, trust us, we try. Uh, they don't, they just won't do it. So, um, and of course, if somebody has an actual life event, well, that's not hot money. That's just like a life event, right? So this has not been our experience. And, um, and again, I think this whole idea of hot money also reflects a very uh, sort of outdated uh, notion of this. We're back to like, as how I was talking about, quote, relationship banking. Well, we saw what happened to relationship banking. If there's an actual concern about credit, so much for the relationship, right? And so um, the fact that CDs can be structured, there's much more awareness around FDIC insurance. There are a lot more stop gaps in place to make this really much more stable funding. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Um, but I also heard that General Lair's talking about like most CDs like are per team month. And then, so are you, are you saying that people are buying longer term CDs or are you saying people who buy a 13 month CD are rolling it into another CD? Yeah, the latter, when I talk about that 70% retention that can get you out to more like a three year, that's people renewing over three years. Uh, not to mention on top of that, yeah, right now there's some huge opportunities if you go out the curve to get people that would lock in. And again, you don't see many of those people unwinding. So I was more talking about that rollover effect. Yeah. And by the way, all questions and comments are welcome. Thanks for speaking up. So if it, feel free to just raise your hand as we go. Um, okay, luckily everybody felt like we can compete. That's great. Um, so that, that's, that's a hopeful, so that's a good place to start from. Uh, you know, I mean, we'll talk about some specific ways, but again, I, I do think, um, uh, yeah, we'll talk about more strategies on that. Uh, remind me how I think. Okay, so just real quickly, how he's going to take you through CD Valley and how, how it works and what we've built, um, what he and his team have built, which is great. But just quickly, I somewhat alluded to this. So um, CD Valley was started by a bank, Seattle Bank. At the time, it was probably $500 million. Uh, and... Um, the short version of that story is a group of us came in 10 years ago and really repurposed a traditional community bank that had no value proposition. It had a great team. We had all the charter. Everything was in working order, but they had no value proposition. So we closed all the branches, focused on niche business in Seattle. It was a very heavily bank competitive market. And we built that business up. And then we started to build other asset generation channels that were all high yielding loan uh, channels. And as a result, we've always, we built it with the assumption that we would have to be a competitive rate pair. And that was 10 years ago. So we built everything with that assumption and we had a chance to grow pretty dramatically through um, a large loan, like a loan pool acquisition we did with the FDIC. And we had that experience of having the highest rate in the country on our CD campaign, which we were more than happy to pay. It was a very, very, tra it was a very profitable transaction and we could not get on bank rate. We could not get beyond the Seattle Times print edition. And so our CEO, John Blizzard was like, this is crazy. If we're having this problem, every bank and credit union is having some version of this, we should build a marketplace. And we're all like, you're crazy. <laughs> so anyways, that idea did not die. We later went on to pilot it just in the state of Washington. We did everything we're doing here just in Washington and we sent it to all of our CD customers and we got great feedback. They just really liked it. And then towards the end of COVID, uh, when things were still a little bit quiet in the market, we, had, we were in a really strong position. We had a chance to bring Howie on and really build out what you're seeing here. And since then it's been spun out of the bank and it's a separate FinTech. Um, you probably will see Seattle Bank somewhere on there, but the Seattle Bank just is a participant on the, on the website. If our rates get us where they are. So that's how we came about this and it really came to solve this problem um, and a little bit of, of the backstory. Yeah, thanks Josh. Yeah, so what you see here is our CD Valet product. Um, you know, so cdvalet.com, this is basically any consumer can go here, right? And so our goal, as Josh said, was, was really let's build a really sharp, unique shopping experience for people where they can actually get a place, go to a place and find sort of unbiased rates, right? Like it's not a, it's not a bank rate. It's not just a bunch of FIs paying to be listed on the site. And so we've focused the product to obviously deliver a really rich shopping experience. Um, we built customizations to where a user can simplistically, you know, just easily start out and put, you know, simple customized options in and decide if, you know, what they want their shopping experience to look like. Um, we also built geo-targeting, so it actually knows, that, you know, the minute they actually land on the site, if based on their IP, it'll it put them in the right region. Because to your, to your question earlier and your point, I think, I think, you know, what we're still seeing in a lot of the data, even though, and I think Josh mentioned this, even though, you know, there are obviously consumers that are just purely like, hey, I'm just going to go and get after the highest rate. 
there are actually significant amount of consumers that still care about locale and still care about like, hey, I'm gonna go find the best rate, but the best rate in my market, right? So if I live in Nevada, if I live in you know Seattle space, I want an institution that I know is at least <laughs> somewhere that I can get to, right? Yeah, and so we built the product to focus on that. We see the traffic that way. Um, and, and the way that it works today, so what we do with the site is we basically, as you can see, so on the all CDs, we're listing every FI, as Josh says, over 33,000 rates today. So every FI, as long as they have a publicly listed rate, uh, we actually list their CD product for free. Doesn't cost an institution anything. We have a combination of technology and a team that basically QAs the rates and those get updated pretty much on a daily basis. Um, and we make sure that that's maintained, right? So that's just, again, building the, the consistency and, and uh, the, you know, the ecosystem to make sure that consumers have access to all the available rates that are out in the marketplace. Obviously, FIs are, we've seen a lot of, a lot of growth, right? Like when we first kicked this off back in, um, when we started tracking all of the rates nationally back in March of last year, I mean, we were seeing like 18,000 rates that were publicly posted. And now, as I mentioned, we're over 30,000, right? So you're definitely seeing the competition. You're seeing FIs changing their strategies, changing their deposit strategies, changing their CD strategies, right? Because many of those institutions that, you know, basically used to not list their rates because they would deal with each customer on a case by case basis are now, are now basically saying, okay, we have to be able to compete in the space. Yeah, great, great question. Um, we, we are working on a couple different white papers. We've got some use cases. Um, the beauty Josh alluded to, we also have what we call the intelligence tool. Um, that's, so it's basically a full reporting stack behind this uh, that has a lot of reporting related to trends. And so it's one thing that you get as a subscribing institution with us is you get the tools to basically say, hey, we wanna price this appropriately, whether it's in our market, maybe it's nationally, it gives you all the analytics and capabilities so that you can take that back to your Alco team. Like we want institutions to be successful in terms of how they price, right? Like don't overprice, don't give it away. It's, you know, we're not saying you have to be the highest rate payer. And what's interesting is we're, again, we're seeing those that are, you know, well below the highest rate payer still getting a tremendous amount of volume and a tremendous amount of traffic as far as driving deposits to their institution with that open now click that that's being added to their institution here on the on the product. So, sorry, real quick. What do you yep. see Valet doing to like get into like the SEO game where they're like putting hmm. that in front of people based on like the, the region they're in? Yeah. Like how's that working? Yeah, great question. We um, and we have a slide that will cover some of our other marketing tac tactics as well, but as far as SEO goes, we're actually investing we have a full SEO team stacked behind the CD Valet product and so what we're actually doing I mean, for some institutions, we're, we come up before the institution from an SEO perspective in the, in the search engine. Um, so we have a full team really built on sort of just dominating the SEO space as it relates to anything related to CDs, rates, products, and that's our goal, right? Is, that's the key. Yeah. If I'm, if I'm local in my, in my FI district, I want to be able to see this and then go, okay, well, there's, there's the local bank that I should have. Paid. Yeah. Yeah. Why would they? They only go to my banking. Yeah. They don't go to my site to see my rates. So at least this kind of like it, like it highlights it. Yeah. For a, and for quite a few institutions, we've actually taken over their, their brand, right? So if you search their brand, we'll come up before they do. Um, and so yeah. So definitely a, a huge SEO strategy on our on our side. Great question. Um, so yeah, so that's the product, uh, you know, on the consumer facing side of things, right? And as you can see now here, there's a few open now. These are the open nows are, are basically our customers, right? So they're the FIs that have, that have established a relationship with us. Um, and so what I'll do is I'll transition to how that works for the FI uh, related to, you know, the product. Going back to your question before we move on to the product kind of sort of demo approach, from a marketing perspective, we've also done a ton, a ton of work from, a, from, from investment into marketing, right? Like you, so part of the, our product is really focused on like, we want to become an extension of your marketing team, right? Like, especially like if you're 
if you have different strategies, even, even from a regional perspective, maybe you're trying to go national. We have quite a few different partners of ours that, are, that have very different approaches. A couple of them are driving digital brands, for example, and they're just showcasing them through CD Valet. Some are entering new markets and they're just, again, showing just CD products in particular markets just for that new entrance. Um, we even have some FIs that are just um, uh, showcasing a particular rate and a CD product just on CD Valet that's not available to their regular consumers on their regular .com website. Um, and so as you can see here, right, like we've invested in different, different brands, different partnerships, um, CNBC, uh, we've done it with the PGA Tour, right? We're targeting obviously certain demographics. We're also focused on, you know, a little bit of the, the educating of the younger generations as well, right? Because, I mean, if you were to ask like my kid what a CD is, they don't even know what a compact disc is, let alone what a sure. certificate of deposit is, right? So, so there's a little bit of re-education, right? Because now it's become, you know, sort of a much more viable product uh, in, in, in uh, FI's deposit strategies. Um, and so, as I mentioned, uh, from a site statistics standpoint, so today we've, we're approaching about 1.5 million users, visitors to the, count, to the site. Um, we're averaging over 100,000 monthly active users to the page, um, and we have over 150,000 returning users on the regular. So it's, it's definitely garnering a lot of traction, and you know, we, we do a, a, a lot of marketing, especially on the paid search and, um, and, and all of that, to, to really just make sure we get eyeballs to the site, right? Because we want, obviously, them to, to find your institutions. So going back to the product. Uh, so the way that we've done it, we've really built the product to be sort of a la carte, right? Like we know that every institution kind of varies, as I mentioned earlier, from you know what their capabilities are from a technology standpoint, what their level of investment they want to take on, you know, whether that's you know, dollars or resources or people. And so simplistically, we start with the most simple product, which is what we call lead generation. And this is just straightforward, very, very easy. We can literally stand this up within a matter of like a week and have you live and running with an open now button. And what it essentially does is, is really just captures that lead and we qualify that lead. And then the subscription model, the way that it works, it's on a pay per lead basis, right? So it's not so what's different from us is, you know, it's not a pay per click. It's truly like, hey, we want to get you qualified consumers that are actually interested and warm and hot and actually want to buy your product. And so the way that the, the, it works, uh, particularly for like credit unions, and this is an example of Keystone Bank. Um, Keystone is, is, you know, they're targeting just Texas consumers, right? And so, as I mentioned, from a qualification standpoint, what we're focused on here for them is like, hey, we don't want any consumers. We don't want any leads outside of the Texas market. So what we've built within their flow is really just that qualification criteria to say, hey, I'm from Texas or I'm not from Texas. And if I'm not from Texas, we kind of refer them to a different product and try to get them into the obviously the right product. If they are, they can basically continue on. And what we do is we just capture some basic lead information um, and we've built up full reporting and, and technology stack behind the scenes like an admin portal that then the FI has access to and they can operationalize this however they want. I mean, some are using you know, call center staff, some are using branch staff, right? Because now all of a sudden branch staff have a lot of free time, unfortunately. Um, and so they're doing the outreach and actually you know, originating these CDs um, however they feel is, is appropriate. So that, so that's, uh, so this is the example, right? So in Keystone, the way that they've done it um, here is so beyond capturing that lead, we actually drop them. So this is part of the lead gen solution as well. So if you're an institution that actually has an origination solution, we love it, right? Like we absolutely want you to be successful with your digital origination solution. So we can actually deep link them and actually drop them straight into your flow. We can even drop it straight into the actual product itself and just have the applicant go through their application flow within your tech solution. Again, we want you to obviously be able to originate that CD as quickly as possible. API? It can be API, yeah, absolutely. It, it is, it is API. We can, yeah, absolutely. We can, we can build it and you know, those are different, you know, obviously different integrations and we'll work with your, your tech teams to actually do that, but we can absolutely do that. Exactly. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And, that, and that's what's really key about this, right? Like our goal 
is to make sure that these are your customers, these are your members, these are your C retail CDs, right? These are not brokered. We don't want any part of that. Like we want to make sure that they become your customers and remain your customers. Keystone, why they also want the lead, right? To Josh's point earlier is they also want to be able to remarket, right? So they want to capture that information so that in the future, if they want to drive a, you know, a money market campaign, for example, they can certainly do that to that individual. Then if you take it way far to sort of our advanced solution, um, this is where you know, we've, we've done a couple of implementations for this as well, and this is what we call our full origination solution. So we have a full white label solution that we can completely brand for you. So these are for FIs that, look, you know, don't have the tech chops or don't have the technology, don't have the digital account origination. We've basically built it um, and have white labeled it. We completely brand it for you. So the consumer has no idea that it's, you know, CD valet sort of powered behind the scenes. It's your brand, it's your colors, it's your experience, it's your KYC, all of those things. And so the way that the flow works is we, you know, this is an example for uh, Seattle bank, right? These are their docs. We, you know, we provide, you know, all the appropriate disclosures. We'll work with your team to, to build this essential flow. Uh, fully customizable, similar scenario. We can literally stand this solution up probably in, a, you know, in 30 days uh, or less, um, and uh, and you know we'll we'll work through that process with you. But we've done this right for several institutions, so you can think of it as almost like you know out of box cookie cutter, do it once, you know, repeat multiple times. Does it hand off and a conversion? Yeah. So once it's converted, there's no like the bank is then or the credit is relying on themselves to make sure they're reaching out to the customer and say, hey, your, your CD's coming up with renewal. Like, there is no, there's nothing on your side that says, hey, you might want to reach out. Like, so it ends at converting. Correct, for now, right? So we are looking at expanding our solution to, to help the banks, to your point, eventually get to a point where we notify them. We may even serve up the statements on your behalf, right? We're, we're kind of coming up with a, you know, we'll call it a, CDs as a CD as a service strategy product. Um, so that'll evolve over time, but uh, more to come there. Uh, but yeah, so and then the flow is very, very straightforward, right? As you know, CD products are pretty, pretty simple. It's not a complex solution. Um, we go through a flow. The applicant goes through um, ID verification, KYC. Can they be open in trust? In trust? No, not at not at this point. We've not we've not done that with our solution. We've done. You can certainly do that if you can do that within your digital origination solution. Uh, and then, yeah, so the KYC, right, so this is all, you know, using your ID, We've, we have persona behind the scenes, we can certainly use your KYC if you want, so if we want an integration into a different KYC solution like SoCure, for example, we can certainly build that into this as well as far as the flow goes. Uh, then we use account verification to obviously verify that they've got the funds, um, and then basically it's at this point pretty much done for the most part. Um, you know, we've got doc signature in here as well. We're integrated with DocuSign. We also have a full digital signature capability. So if you don't want to pay for a DocuSign integration and the envelope costs, we offer it for free with our solution embedded. Um, and you can, you know, basically sign the docs and we have full core integration to about nine different cores today. Um, we've done a couple of integrations with uh, a couple of institutions at this point already. Full, fully to their core so that it's fully digital and no human intervention. That's a great product. We do have a demo or we have a booth here. So definitely come by and see yep. how we and the team, we can walk through that in more detail if you want. Um, all right, so in the interest of time, let us just jump to a few other ideas about how to take all this, right? So one is just play the rate game to win. So, you know, it used to be that we would basically have Alco Wednesday. We would try to get to Cassandra, our final rates at the end of the Wednesday so she could get it to Seattle Times so they could print it. We'd look at it Sunday in the newspaper and find out Monday if we had a good rate or not, right? Well, now we can basically approve in Alco. We're willing to go up to whatever it is, 485. Let's start it at 450 on CD Valet and see what happens. And if you're not getting anything after a little bit of time, send us an email and next business day we can change the rate. Or start high, get some volume going, send us an email the next day and we can drop it down. So you just start to have that flexibility. We can put in budget caps saying, hey, don't send us more than X dollars in leads. Um, and we can all, and so you have just much more flexibility about how you're in the market. Uh, so that's one is just getting digital, right? In terms of how we advertise literally our rates. Uh, two, 
Uh, how we kind of alluded to this, and many of you have thought about this, so whether it's an actual full sub-brand or sort of the cheap version of a sub-brand is just run a campaign in another geography, right? Uh, it's all going to be disclosed, but the reality is you don't have to publish it anywhere you don't want to. You can put it on CD Valley if it's a high rate and it's going to be geocoded to Texas. People in Texas are going to show up on their screen and you'll get some money, right? Three, I'm moving through these quickly through so stay on time here. <laughs> Uh, yeah, this is sort of obvious, right? But back to how you'd sort of, where there are opportunities to still differentiate ourselves, still have a value proposition, right? Is once you get this customer, call them up and say, thank you. By the way, we can help you structure to make sure that you have all of your funds are insured and our publish rate might've been this. Maybe we offer you a different rate or whatever. So there's options to do that. I know it seems somewhat obvious, but we do, uh, oftentimes we hear from um, FIs that are out competing digitally, they're not doing the things that they used to do in the branch from a relationship standpoint. And so there's a chance to just combine those. Um, so this one, uh, uh, le leveraging the transfer of uh, generation of wealth is just like a topic. I was at a uh, user um, conference recently and I heard a lot of really great ideas come in from mostly on the credit union side around recognizing they have older on average customers and how they can use that opportunity to start to get to meet the next generation. Um, I told him about Alan's business ribbon. I've told about probably a half dozen people about his business. You should meet him after this if this is an interesting strategy to you because he's developed software and a solution around that. But this just seems like the perfect opportunity to leverage CDs. You already know they're high value. You have that relationship. Take the fact that there's already discussion about beneficiaries. Many CD shoppers are already thinking about that anyway and use that as the opportunity. So I think there's a great example of things that are already happening in the progressive community banks and credit unions to leverage the CDs. And then the last one, I think it's the last one. Yeah, so this might seem a little bit out of the ordinary, but the reality is, um, you know, there's an opportunity to go out if you have an aggressive CD campaign and, you, and if you can't immediately, if you don't have access to go generate new loans on your own, go buy marketplace loans. Upgrade is here. I can introduce you to Rebecca on the like showroom floor. Go buy marketplace loans, call us. We know FIs because they're high payers that are always generating assets looking to sell. Everybody here gets probably called on by, you know, Breen and uh, Sandler. Go buy some high yielding loans and then go run a, a strong CD campaign. Now that might not necessarily be sustainable. It might not necessarily be you're gonna, it's not a long-term strategy, but it creates an opportunity to go step up the basis of our book, right? How do you revolve the book, start to getting some assets on the balance sheet that are actually relatively market rate? Um, well, you could do that if you have the ability to go to deposits. And if you know you're getting solid assets, then it doesn't, you're, you now have the ability to go out and be targeted about having some high paying deposits. So, you know, I mean, I guess in conclusion, what we tend to see is there are sort of three um, sort of stances that FI seem to take in the CD market. We're not here to say CDs are the end all be all, right? But we do think they're a pretty valuable and effective tool. And we're not saying that every bank is in credit union should have the same approach. What we are saying is if and when you need to use CDs, CD Valley is the place to do it, right? You get visibility and have the ability to convert. Some FIs are always gonna be those aggressive payers. They're the small versions of cap one. You know, and we know who they are. They're the very aggressive credit card issuers, some of the Utah banks, uh, the direct, uh, some of the uh, indirect auto lenders, some of the home improvement lenders. They're always gonna be aggressive rate payers because they've built really strong asset generation. Probably most fall into more of the middle, opportunistic, periodic, you know, maybe once or twice a year, or maybe it's once every other year they do a CD campaign because they need to like rebalance the portfolio or they're having growth in one area or runoff in another area. And again, when you want to do that, um, then that's then then you can be on CD Valet. And lastly, some just want it as contingency funding. They will. They, it's like in case of emergency break glass, they never want to have a high rate CD because they have tons of deposits. That's fine. It is nice to know that if there's a problem, you have one more option. The main goal, and really what's interesting about this is on the one hand, what we've talked a lot about rate, we've talked a lot about that the CD customers are rate driven. You know, I know that tears at the heartstrings of all of us that like wanna say that we're selling service and value, and it should, right? But the key is to say, hey, where are the parts where I can go sell value on something other than price? And where do I have to sell on price? If you have to sell on price, you want to be on CD Valet where you can get visibility and conversion. Otherwise, you're overpaying. How else do you explain that right now in CD Valet, we can find rates in the sixes when those same consumers, when bank, like, like bank Capital One is issuing that same paper in the fours? 
because the FIs that are paying in the sixes are compensating for bad digital exposure and bad digital experience. So we want to get FIs on CD Valet so they can actually bring their cost of funds down. They can just compete with a few basis point, not a hundred. They can get the money they need fast and then drop their rates and get out of the market and then go back to relationship business, right? Go back to those other things, um, having put the balance sheet back to work. So appreciate you guys taking some time with us today. We're here. If there's questions, we can stay and chat here. Otherwise, um, we do have a booth. It's on the west side. It's right by a bar, so that's a good spot. If you come and see us, drinks are on us. And um, that was a joke. We're just going to show you where the bar is. And um, if you scan this, you can get a, a trial to the uh, market intelligence tool. So any questions before we let you go? All right. Well, thanks, everybody.